In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, Pentecost then. There were three great festivals in the time of Jesus that Jewish men living within 20 miles of Jerusalem had to attend. It was the law, and you had to do it. Well, the first was Passover, and um, the Jewish Passover was just a couple of weeks ago. Then there was Pentecost, and then there were the Tabernacles, the Feast of the Tabernacles. It was in October the 16th, and it commemorated the wandering, the time in the wilderness. And it also looked forward for the Messiah, and it also uh, was thanksgiving for the harvest. Pentecost then was uh, in commemoration of the giving of the Ten Commandments to Moses, but it also coincided with the very first harvest of the barley crop, and it was a three-day national holiday, and even slaves got the days off. But it was springtime and early summer, and it was warm, and people were very happy, and they had a great time. And lots of people came from other parts of the Mediterranean area to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. That's why all these names were there. Um, so, uh, they had a great time. And the Jews were very good at celebrating things, and they had a joyfulness. You wouldn't think that. It's not emphasized when the popular view of Jews and their history and all the rest of it doesn't emphasize how happy they were. They had a capacity for joyful worship. Jewish weddings are, are wonderfully joyful. And um, it's rooted in their sense of identity and their calling and the presence of God in their lives. Now, we Presbyterians, we are not noted for our joyfulness of life, living, or worship. Although... We're kind of split personalities because if we're somewhere else, nothing to do with the church, we're perfectly happy and able to let our hair down if we have hair to let down. <laughs> but our worship has never been full of joyfulness. And people who don't worship with us think it's boring. Young people think, oh, I'm not going to church. It's boring, boring, boring. Worship is not boring. It's not to be entertainment. It is actually the creative, redemptive power of God. That's what worship is. That's why we're here. That's what's in us, making us come and sing these hymns. And what people who think it's boring need is a gift of the Holy Spirit to change them from perceiving something as being boring to it becoming something beautiful, good, and great within. Now, I don't know if you noticed or picked up on that reading from Acts. A very key aspect of the whole thing was there were 120 of them about there in that room. They were united, it said, they're united. They were together, they had one purpose, waiting for this moment when the Holy Spirit would come. Not that they knew exactly what was going to happen, they were just waiting in obedience. And uh, that's beautiful and pristine. It has to be said that trouble came to the early Christian church very early in its life. But on Pentecost, it was all wonderful, glorious, happy, and fulfillment. You contrast that with the churches of today. The Church of Scotland is not united. Um, apart from disagreements on things like homosexuality and the ministry and the politics of the day and the land, there are plenty of other issues. Some years ago, the minister of Kirkmuir Hill Church along the road there uh, asked the General Assembly to forbid a church in Aberdeen f to, uh, from letting their halls to local Hindus for their worship. Now, his argument, the evangelical argument, was 
No other name under heaven can you be saved than Jesus. And these halls and church buildings are consecrated to God and Jesus. Hindus are polytheists. They worship all sorts of gods, elephant gods, fertility gods, all sorts of stuff. You can't have that in the church of Scotland. The liberals oppose this in the assembly. And their argument would be, as you could probably understand, no, these are decent people, family people. They need somewhere to have their services of worship and gather together. We can be good neighbors to them and offer them our hall. So the General Assembly voted, and Ian uh, Watson's motion was defeated by 253 to 289. And that's a classic evangelical liberal battle in the Church of Scotland. And it infects everything that the Church of Scotland does. It's political statements, it's attempts to communicate the gospel and all the rest of it. And we belong to it, and we are hindered by that lack of unity in our church. There are plenty of other churches. The Anglican church is split again over homosexuality and whether or not women should be bishops. Well, there are women bishops, but some don't like it. The Catholic church is as split as any other, but it has this single figure of the Pope at its head, so it looks united, and it is united in the figure of the Pope. In America, lots of churches have sprung up. You don't just, they may have inherited Anglicanism and Catholicism and Presbyterianism, and it was the foundation of, of the country. But there's lots and lots of uh, independent churches. There's some of them very large, they're called mega churches. Church of the Redemption, Church of the Second Coming, this, that, and the next thing. And there's all these splits in understanding. And you get the same thing in Africa now as well. And they have lots and lots of denominations. And when you think of those thousands of churches, there are actually thousands of denominations in the church in Africa. And they are in th they, they, these independent ones have sprung up independently of inherited Western churches like ours. And they're very enthusiastic and energetic, and they've got the rhythm. I'm looking at two Africans there and say, is this, this is true, isn't it? You recognize it? Thank you for that. And uh, there's, there's lots and lots of them, lots and lots of them. And they have names like Zionist and Apostolic and Messianic. And they, even when they wear uniforms, some of them, they worship out in the open a lot, but there's actually masses of them. Uh, now, there was one chap called Simon Kimbangu. He was born in 1887 in a village called Nkamba in what was then known as the Belgian Congo. And it was one of the worst, most repressive and cruel colonial administrations in history. Br <coughs> brutal towards the people who lived there, and it was there home and reinforced by Catholic uh, doctrine and orthodoxy. A chap called Simon then, and he was uh, influenced by British Baptist ministry and became a Christian, and they baptized him in the river. And he felt uh, a call to be a prophet and healer. And he had a vision. He had a vision uh, that one day on the hill outside the village there, a great church would be built. And that uh, at some stage, people would come from all over the world to worship in it. But he was frightened like Jonah of what God was asking him to do. And he ran away to Leopoldville, to Kinshasa, as it is, and tried to work there and find work. For three years he did. Then he came back, and he started his ministry 
which was a modern Pentecostal ministry on the scale of what we've just read about in Acts. Within six months, there were apparently about 10,000 people in his gathering. It wasn't fully a church at that stage. He was a Protestant evangelist, prophet, and he was gathering a great following and becoming very influential. And the colonial government were threatened by him, and the Catholic Church uh, was threatened by him. So they decided to deal with him. And uh, they charged him, and they, it was a mockery of a trial. He wasn't even allowed a defense lawyer. And uh, they sentenced him to be whipped, to be thrashed like Jesus. And they sentenced him to be put to death like Jesus, even though he had done nothing to deserve it. The Belgian emperor, Leopold, uh, Albert, uh, Albert I, commuted that sentence to life imprisonment. And he was sent to another part of the Congo. And he spent the next 33 years in prison. He never saw his wife and children, three sons again. In 1960, the Congo became Zaire. It became independent. And amazingly, this underground church of his had survived all these years, helped by his wife, Mary. They kept kind of going. They were banned. They were prescribed. They were like the church in China. But they, st they still got. And then the new government, the African government, legitimized them. Said, you can carry on. God bless you. And they discovered there were several million people belonging to this church. They called them the Kimbanguists after his surname, Kimbangu. There were several million uh, of them. And uh, he died in 1951, age 64. In, uh, can we have a picture then of that uh, church? They built this church that he had prophesied would be built in 1921. You see the scale of it. And all the people who are there and uh, in uh, 1969, they applied to be admitted to the World Council of Churches, and they were. And in 1981, Christian leaders from all over the world came to that church on the 60th anniversary of his prophecy of the church being built and the people coming to celebrate his life. Mandela was in prison, as you know, for 27 years. But this poor man was in prison for 33 he never got out. He died there. The price that he paid for this explosion, this Pentecostal explosion of faith and uh, Christian salvation among all of these people was very, very great. And that church is still going. It's, it's got millions. It's expanded into other parts of Africa. So these are, these are modern. These are modern examples of the Spirit moving big time in a way that's beyond our comprehension when we think of our Christianity in this land at this time. Because ours is a very settled and gentle and quiet sort of expression of faith. We, you could argue that we are certainly not fully empowered by the Holy Spirit or an awful lot would be happening, not due to us, but due to the movement of the Holy Spirit spirit in our midst. Now moving on in the text, there's a big deal about the speaking in tongues. And you heard about it. And the key was we all hear them speaking in our own language. And that seems weird and strange and supernatural. But God speaks to us all in our own language. God the Holy Spirit speaks to us in our language, speaks to German people in theirs, French in theirs. 
Brazilians and Portuguese, Eskimos and Inuit. That's the way the Holy Spirit has worked among all people in all languages for all of those years. But there's something brilliant happened, beautiful, that spread out and it touched and affected people who weren't part of the church. And you see, there were two groups. There were two people. One of the groups was saying, well, what's going on here? What is this? What is it about? And there was another group of people, the atheists, the cynics, the hard-nosed, the hard-minded people. Uh, they're drunk. They're, they're all drunk. So, the, whole, the, the, the the giving of the, the Holy Spirit and the association with speaking in tongues has been an interesting thing in Christian history because the mainline churches over the centuries never practiced, never practiced uh, speaking in tongues. Against all the odds in the 20th century, against the history of the rational intellectual Calvinism, uh, 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 of the West and Anglicanism and the strict doctrinal positions of the Catholics. Against all of that, in the 20th century, a new form of Pentecostalism suddenly sprung up. Sprung up in America. It spread to Central America and South America. And of course, as we've heard, it also sprung up in Africa. Now, do any of you remember the Toronto Blessing? Yeah. Now, that was one of the phenomenons of uh, the 20th century, 1994, from the Vineyard Church in California. It was a confused situation. There was a great blessing in it, but some of the worship was a bit strange. People had a strange gift of laughing an awful lot. Some would roll around, some were slayed in the spirit, some barked like dogs. And Christian said, is this the real deal here, or is this a fraudulent kind of thing? Toronto Blessing came to Scotland. It didn't have a great impact. So one of the things that we need to consider in all of this is that in large measure, Christianity of the centuries, the 1995, has not been Pentecostal in character and nature. It's been reflective and rational and reasonable and understandable. More so in Scotland, with such an educated ministry, when few other countries had anything like it. And so we come to Paul. Because Paul had an answer for this, and it's very interesting. Could we have the first text, please? Now, this is from 1 Corinthians 12. About the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. Now, to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of the one and the same Spirit as he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Did you notice what came last in Paul's teaching? What came last in the gifts of the Spirit was speaking in tongues. Next uh, uh, text, please, Lewis. He goes on in chapter 14. And this is definitive for us. Now, brothers and sisters... If I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will I be to you unless I bring some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? For this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that they may interpret what they say. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. 
what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. Otherwise, when you are praising God in the spirit, how can someone else who is now put in the position of an inquirer say, Amen to your thanksgiving, since they do not know what you are saying? You are giving thanks well enough, but no one else is edified, no one else understands. Then he says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you, but in the church I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. When you think of uh, Scotland, too, over the centuries, um, ours has been a Christianity that would follow Paul in that respect. Very, very few of the great Christians of history spoke in tongues. David Livingston never did. Mary Slessor didn't. Jane uh, Haining didn't. As she went to Auschwitz with her little girls, little Jewish girls from their school in Budapest. Even the 20th century, great Christians, they never spoke in tongues. But... There's a new form of Pentecostal worship which doesn't really emphasize speaking in tongues in that way that you have to have it to be a proper born-again Christian. And it's surprising, some of these churches originated in Australia. The Hillsong Church, they have now churches all over the world. The Glow Church have churches in this land as well. And in Scotland, there's the Destiny Churches. And they have a different form of worship from ours. Their worship is like a pop concert. They have a big stage, they have a good band, and uh, they sing high tempo, loud, loud uh, gospel songs based on the scriptures. They seek conversion and people to be born again. You can dance, you can whatever you want to do. Maybe some speaking tongues, it's not emphasized. You don't have to. And because of the music, it attracts young people. And they are great at bringing in lots and lots of young people, which they do. And it's high energy, and people are uplifted, and it helps them and encourages them, and they feel healed, they feel blessed at their best. There's another side to it. They are very authoritarian. They do not have Kirk sessions. But their energy and power in the land is great and reaching lots and lots of young people and older people. Now, you see some of them occasionally on songs of praise, that kind of church. Back to the text then. Peter gets up to explain what's happening. And he goes back to Joel, as you heard in the scriptures. This was in the Bible. This was prophesied that this would happen. That there would be a time when the Holy Spirit would not be confined to singular prophets. Like uh, Elisha or Ezekiel or whatever. Uh, but everybody would be touched by the Holy Spirit. Children. Adults. Elderly. Filled with the Spirit. Prophesying and joyful in worship. This was God's promise. And that's what happened. In the Old Testament, you had Elisha and Elijah. They were great, ecstatic, charismatic prophets. But you also had Isaiah and Jeremiah, who were literary figures. And you could argue that their influence over the thousands of years has been much, much greater than that of the ecstatic, charismatic forebearers. So we should always remember that the great majority of Christians in the world worship more peacefully and quietly than uh, modern Pentecostalism. But there's two things. One, the modern Pentecostal church attracts young people by the hundreds and by the thousands. And the second thing is that they, they have an outreach power and empowerment that we do not show. 
So where does this leave us then as we think of Pentecost and the church's birthday next week, this week coming, leading up to it? Is there any expectation here of this congregation being empowered by the Holy Spirit? Even in a even in a modest version of what happened on Pentecost Day. Now, it already is or we wouldn't be here because you would just have gone and done lots of other things, but God, the Lord, brought you here to worship. Where do we go, though? Is there any clue as a way forward? We must be missing something. There is more to Christianity than what we do in our churches. Are we seeking enough? Are we asking, praying for this level of involvement, empowerment, revival in our congregation? Are we thinking of the future of Christ's kingdom in New Farm Lock where we are not here any longer? Is there anything we can do while we are here? Peter says, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Anyone. Don't let anybody say that Christianity isn't inclusive. Anyone who calls in the name of the Lord. There's a corollary to that. What is God calling you and me to be doing? Because you can't retire from Christianity and you do not get a pension. You get a reward and place in heaven. If some people said, yes, we must pray more, and we must pray more for revival in our church and in New Farm Lock, would that split the congregation? Would it create a church within a church where people are seen to be more pious and more committed than others who don't want that path? And that happens all over the place as well. So, How can we move forward as one congregation, everybody together, but take on board the message of Pentecost? The Holy Spirit is there to be empowering for us. The Holy Spirit can move and revival a new farm lock sometime. Will we see it? Will we have that hope and vision in everything we do as a church? And it might come about. Could we do it together? Could we be one? And the final word is Peter's. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Anyone among the 5,000 here in New Farm Law. And we have to take that message. We have to live it, expect it, pray for it, and hope that it will actually happen.